are going to take a break from reactions in this lecture module. Ooh, you know, for some of you, you might be thinking, well, shoot, I was just getting used to these reactions and they weren't too bad. Is this all organic is? And the answer is, yeah, kind of. But I am going to take a break because there are people that are out there. They're like, I'd never want to see another reaction in my life. Please, when are we going to stop this nonsense? So we're going to take a pause. We're going to take a pause in the reactions. And this is why I somewhat go out of order with a traditional textbook. And what we're going to focus on in this lecture module is something called stereochemistry. Okay, stereochemistry, is that like listening to organic compounds? And the answer is, nah, not really. That, that's not what this is about. That's the stereo system at your house. That's not the stereo system that organic chemistry decides to use. So before we go further with our description in the world of stereochemistry, and folks are either going to love it or you're going to hate it, I want to go back and take a review of certain topics that we have already discussed, certain topics that you are a pro at basically explaining to a stranger right now. And one of these very early terms was something called an isomer. Do you remember what an isomer was? Well, I hope that you are shaking your head saying, yes, I remember what an isomer is. An isomer, iso means same, and mer means unit, same unit. So this was a word that we used to describe certain compounds that had maybe the same number of carbons, the same number of hydrogens, and so forth. Maybe the same number of oxygens too. Maybe the same number of nitrogens as well. But we were focused on hydrocarbons back then, back way, way, way back when. But it also holds true to any functional group that we include in organic chemistry. All right, so quick review. Let's say that we have a six carbon chain. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, we call this hexane, don't we? Yes, we know how to name that now. Okay, well, let's draw an isomer of hexane, which means draw this a different way, folks. Just don't put it in a straight line. That's all that you have to do. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, and then let's kink this one down to make six. That's an isomer. Ah, wrong. That's not an isomer. Why isn't that an isomer? Well, let's look at this. If I gave you this a problem on a test and I say, name it, what would you tell me? Find the longest carbon continuous chain, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you would say, this is called hexane. And I would say, ding, ding, you're correct. All right, so this is not an isomer. However, if we erased that carbon that we kind of pointed down on the very end, then move it in one more, that is an isomer. The longest carbon chain here is one, two, three, four, five, that we call pentane, right? And then on carbon number two from the end, we have a methyl group, two methyl pentane. Look, I just reviewed a whole lecture module that we talked very early on about. See how sneaky? Okay, well, can we draw another isomer? Why, yes, of course we can. Let's try another one. One, two, three, four, five. And instead of the one, Next to the end, let's shift it one more in. Name it. Okay, we know how to do this. We know IUPAC rules for alkanes. All right, so one, two, three, four, five. Pentane again. But this time on carbon number three, I have a methyl group, right? Yes, 3-methylpentane. That is a different name than 2-methylpentane, which means that that is a different molecule than 2-methylpentane, which means that that is another isomer. Folks, some of these molecules can have tons, tons of isomers. Can we draw another one? Well, you might look at this and go, well, maybe 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Well, we did this one, then we did the middle one, so why don't we do this one? 
Well, you hopefully will already know what I'm going to do. <clears throat> Wrong. That's not right. Why isn't that right? Well, let's name it. If you gave me a name for that molecule, one, two, three, four, five, we would call this a pentane. And on carbon two, I have a methyl group. So two methyl pentane. Folks, that's the same as what we did over here. These two are the same molecule, right? These two are the same. There's no difference in them. I've just flipped one of these around. That's all that I've done. So because they are the same molecule, that really isn't an isomer, another isomer at least, of hexane. We've already represented that one. So we can't include it again. That's silly. But what else can we do? Okay, well, if I take that carbon and I move it on to the end, and I put it here, and I say, name it. What are you going to give me? Well, hopefully you're going to look at this and go, longest carbon chain, well, there's six in a row. That's going to be hexane. Yes, that is correct. And look, we've already represented that one too. So that one cannot be an isomer either, an extra one, because we've already represented that one. So are there any more isomers? Yes, there are, because look at what I can do. I could, if I wanted, let's keep a hydro or a carbon right there, shall we? Let's keep a carbon right there. And then let's put one right here. But in doing so, I've got to get rid of another carbon. One, two, three, four, one up for five, one down for six. Is that a different isomer? Is it? Well, name it. Naming is going to be the clue here. All right, so one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, down for four, or one, two, three, and up for four, really doesn't matter how I go. I just go straight across. It's forward no matter which direction you go. So this is a butane. Oh, we've not represented a butane before, have we? So this possibly is going to be another isomer. All right, well, if I point one up and point one down, there are two methyl groups, so this is a dimethyl, and this is going to happen on carbon 2. But I've got to represent where each one is located, so it has to be 2,2-dimethylbutane. I know that seems silly, but that's just the way IUPAC wants. It wants a number for every group that you assign to the name. All right, so this is another isomer. Can we keep going? Well... That's for you to figure out. Could we keep drawing different structures only having six carbons, and that's it, in order to give me any other type of different structure? Well, you tell me, all right? But this is the world of isomer, and this is the world that we are going to venture into a little bit more detail because in the past, we just introduced it, folks. That's all that I did. I just introduced you to the world of isomer. I said, this is the definition of an isomer. And this is what an isomer is. And we have sex and isos. And we just kind of dropped it after that. And I really didn't explain that in detail any more other than that brief acquaintance that you had with it back in the day. Well, now we need more details. Now we need to go further. So, in the world of isomer, there are two different versions. Version 1 is going to be called a constitutional isomer. Are you familiar with the Constitution? If not, shame, shame, shame on you. Number two, we have another family or grouping of isomers that we like to talk about in organic. And this grouping is called a stereo isomer. Oh, now we're getting details. Now we're getting nitty gritty. Constitutional isomers, I'm going to put check. This is what we've really focused on. A constitutional isomer is different 
in the way that they are connected. So what we just did, we represented constitutional isomers on a sheet of paper for hexane. We did hexane, then we did 2-methylpentane, and then 3-methylpentane, and then maybe 3-3 three, three, or 2-2 two, two, or whatever it was. I forgot what we drew. Those are constitutional isomers. This is something that we've always worked with so far in the class. And we never really stepped outside of this arena. This is where we felt comfortable. This is what we introduced. This is what we've been drawing all this time. But folks, there's a whole other side of isomer that we haven't tackled yet. And that is number two. And that's what this lecture is going to focus on. It's going to focus on something that we call a stereo isomer. So we're going to have to figure out what a stereo isomer is, right? Well, some people, they don't like the word stereo isomer. Don't ask me why. They just don't. So they use a different name for this, and it really is tomato-tomato kind of stuff, right? How do you want to refer to it? Whatever makes you feel good. If they don't want to call it stereo isomer, they're going to call this configurational isomer. Now you see the problem. Because we have configurational and we have constitutional. This is one of the reasons that people do not like the word configurational. Because configurational and constitutional, they're pretty similar on a sheet of paper. And if I'm in a hurry and I briefly read a description or if I briefly read directions, then maybe this configurational definition is going to give me some problem. I might quickly read configurational and think they're wanting constitutional. So because of that, the scientific community decided, uh, maybe we just need to get away from this term configurational, and maybe we just don't need to use it that much. Maybe we need to change this word, and we're going to change this word to stereoisomer instead. That way there is a distinct difference, and you will not get them confused, even if you're reading a paragraph fairly quickly. So most of the scientific community went along with it. And we're like, okay, yeah, we can see that justification. Not a big deal. But there's some old school people that just refuse change. And they're just stubborn. And they don't want to learn anything new, even if it's a new word. And they fought against stereoisomer, and they still call it configurational. And maybe your textbook is going to do that too, just to try to trick you up. So keep in mind, configurational is stereo isomer. Now here's the thing. Stereo isomers or configurational isomers, they are not connected differently. I want you to process that for a minute. Okay, so you're telling me that these isomers are connected in the same way? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. Okay, then that's kind of weird because if they're connected the same way, doesn't that make them the same compound? No. They're not the same compound. Uh, okay, well... How does that even make sense? That's always the question that people have in organic. So, the way that I need you to think about this from this point on is your left hand and your right hand. You have fingers and a thumb. The fingers and the thumb are connected to your palm. Whether it's on your left hand or your right hand, hopefully you have four fingers and a thumb. Most people. Most people do. If not, I don't judge. So, left hand and right hand are the same components. They're the same number of components. They are connected to the same thing. But what's the difference between your left hand and your right hand? 
How would you explain it to somebody? How are they different? Well, hopefully the magic term here is something called a mirror image of each other. Right? One is almost just kind of flipped. That's really what this is about. So with the definition of configurational or stereo isomer, these are isomers that are not connected differently. But they are different. And they are different in the way the atoms are arranged in space. That's the biggest difference. Your left hand and your right hand are made up of the same things, connected really in the same way. They're just mirror images of each other. So therefore, they are not connected differently. Your left hand and your right hand are not constitutional isomers. That would mean that someone would have to take your index finger, your pointer finger, and maybe switch it with your thumb. That would be a constitutional isomer. Do you have constitutional hands? Uh, I don't think so. I hope that you don't have a thumb where your middle finger is at and your middle finger where your thumb is at because that's constitutional isomers. That would look kind of funny, but kind of neat, too, at the same time, wouldn't it? Could you imagine? Well, never mind. Okay, so stereoisomer would be something like your left hand, right hand. Your hands are connected in a similar way, but they are just arranged differently in space. They're all kind of four fingers up on top, one thumb to the side, but they are just flip-flopped. They're just mirror images of each other. And molecules are the same way. So what that means to us is that molecules are going to be left-handed and molecules can also be right-handed. And we're going to have to get comfortable with the idea of picking out which ones are left and which ones are right. That is what this lecture is going to focus on. Folks, that's all there is to this lecture. It's being able to draw these isomers, being able to label them as left-handed or as right-handed, and that's pretty much it. So not too many reactions not too many calculations. There might be a few, maybe toward the end, because there's a certain property that these will bring to the table. But once again, it's a very nice break. It's a nice break in nomenclature that we did two rounds of. It's a nice break in reactions that we did two rounds of. And this just kind of breaks all of that up once more, and it introduces a new topic that people might like a little bit better or you might hate and whichever way it is it's okay it's just part of the nature of organic chemistry all right so that's where this video is going to stop and in the next video we'll pick up with this concept of stereochemistry or stereoisomers and we'll dig a little bit deeper into the lecture theory come back and see me. I'll be here, like always. I never escape your computer. Help! <laughs>